to see all of you. Um, thank you for uploading the video of week three. That was fantastic. Um, but I realized that all of you are very serious. Well, except for <laughs> but she sang a song which is brilliant. So next time I expect all of you to do some dance or something, okay? <laughs> no, I mean it's fine. It's probably one of your first video logs to be posted up. So, but you get a lot more chance to do what uh, what. I mean, you get a lot more chance in this module to do uh, put out videos and discussions and stuff. I think one of the main things you need to remember is that, um, yeah, it's quite serious stuff. We're all doing a master's, and, but it, it doesn't mean that we can't have fun as well. And the reason why I've included videos and doing silly stuff like that, well, it's actually not quite silly. There is a reason for why, why we're doing that. It's because um, I want you to enjoy, a lot of times when we go into a study, module, we don't really enjoy what most of the time we enjoy. Some occasions we do enjoy, but I want you guys to be engaged and the main thing is to enjoy. But partly, another reason why I'm using videos is because a lot of, I mean you'll be full time, but there are some part timers as well as people who are online as well. We expect more people to join us in this module, so that means that uh, we have to have some form of interaction, otherwise, um, it may be that, it, and it really depends on the year. Sometimes the full-time group is small, and the online group is large. So who, you won't have a lot of interaction about you, which is nice, you're having a small group, but you will want to leverage on the experience of some of the people who are studying it online. So for the online people, you would also want to think about leveraging on some of the expertise that the full-timers who are on campus have, but it's also that interaction as well, knowing other people, clinicians that you interact uh, with in other places. Who knows, one day that you might visit that country and you go, hi, I'm coming to you, can I visit you? And you make friends that way and I can, I can tell you um, how many times I've uh, made friends online or previous classmates who are from different countries. And then when I do visit, I, I, I do visit that country, I tend to go visit them or visit their clinics as well just to find out what they do for a living. So, that, so just keep that in mind, and that's the reason why we're doing this. I know all of you will know who I am. I don't need to reintroduce myself, but just in case for the benefit of those who haven't been following us for the past five weeks, my name is Chiwi. Uh, you can just call me Chiwi. You don't need to call any of my title because it doesn't really matter. It just means I studied really hard. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm from Singapore, and um, I've been in this country for quite some time. I studied in London, I did my undergraduate in London, but I went back home to Singapore to practice. I was in the, um, I was in the military, so I was a former um, soldier as well as a therapist within the, um, uh, the armed forces in my country. And then after that, I joined the public sector. So during public sector, you usually do the things you usually do as a junior physio, you rotate around. And then the very last place that I was at, which I loved and specialized in, was in HIV rehabilitation. Uh, some of you may know me that I am into pain management. You know, what? HIV, AIDS, rehabilitation, and pain? Well, there are a lot of conditions within. For, for those of you who know about HIV re rehabilitation, is that these, um, these people have got an immunocompromised system, and therefore, they are much more liable for all sorts of infections. Some of these viruses and bacteria might attack the neurological system, might attack um, a lot of different systems in general. And because of those infections, there is a lot of pain involved, especially if it attacks the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system. And that's why I got interested in that. For, because of that, that led me to my postgraduate studies. I actually came here, they offered me a scholarship to do my uh, PhD here, after which they offered me a job. So if they offer you a job, you don't say no. Um, and then uh, that, that's when I settled here. And, uh, Obviously, a wife and two boys. You see, one of my boys, the other boy tends not to go into videos, so that's fine. Uh, you sometimes occasionally hear him in the background. So that's a bit about me. Um, now, in this particular lecture, I'm, 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 I'm just going to call it a lecture because I'm going to talk to you a lot, and I like to talk. Okay, I like to talk, even though I'm a bit of an introvert. But when I am in my lecture or clinician, I just go yeah, 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 yeah. I just can't stop, um, and you know people have to physically 
restrain me, you know, stop me from talking. So I'm just going to say that this is a lecture, and what we're going to do is we're going to we're, we're going to um, look at um, several things. These are all very logistic stuff. So things like why are we doing this, okay? And um, some of the aims and learning outcomes. Well, you probably have read them, but I'm just going to simplify the learning outcomes for you. Because sometimes when you read learning outcomes and aims, it goes blah, 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 blah. And that's exactly what you hear when you read the words in your head. It's a bit like, you know, Simpsons dog. When, when the family is talking, all the dog here is blah, 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 blah. Exactly. That's, which is why I'm here to simplify the aims and the learning outcomes for you. And I also give you a bit about logistics. I mean, you've gone through five weeks. But let me just give you an overview of the entire module throughout the year. This is, this is a very long module. It's going to last until semester two. So, and I've also given you some um, sheets. For those who are online, I'm going to upload this onto the hub so that you can download both the lecture as well as the, um, the, the, the sheet that the students currently are having. It outlines every single week what we'll, what we'll be doing, including the reading that we'll be doing, even though every single week in a weekly focus, I'll still reveal to you, remind you what you're supposed to read. But if you are having a, you know, if you really enjoy the book and it's a really small book, and you can put it in your handbag or put it in your bag and you're on a bus, you read, but I think you can always just flip it and just have a read. But look, talk about the most important thing that will matter to all of you, which is the assessment. Oh my god, what am I going to do? Uh, how am I going to pass this module? Well, I'm going to tell you. Okay? It's going to be a lot of work, it's going to be hard work, I'm not going to kid you that this is going to be hard work. But at the same time, we're going to have some fun as well. Okay? My, my philosophy in doing assessments for myself, and when I was a student, and for, as a lecturer, is that when I get students to work hard, I make sure that they have a little bit of fun as well. Because otherwise, it's really hard to sustain their engagement with the, um, with the assessment themselves. And then I'll ask you any questions that I answer. So it's not personal, you can ask me anything about this module. Okay, so now, aims. Oh, by the way, I put that at arrow there because the entire family now is watching arrow. Uh, for those of you who don't know what arrow is, you should watch it. Uh, <laughs> it's a very good TV series. Um, now, this is the aims of this entire module. Um, there are some things that you probably need to take note of is that because you're doing it at the master's level, is that someone to go, would you mind just helping me to let him in? Thank you. Um, there are some things, keywords that you need to take off. Sorry. Come on in, that's fine. Just grab a chair and just join us. Just be careful that we are, I'm actually videoing that. So okay. just, just make sure you don't block them. Otherwise, the online students won't be very happy. <laughs> um, so there are certain things and skills that you need to employ. You may have already have them, or you may be still developing them, but the main thing is that you need to um, get your, these skills out and actually use them and show that you're starting to use these skills. The very first thing is, you need to be able to evaluate and critique. Okay, that is extremely difficult for a lot of students, but it's not impossible. Along the way, I mean, you've got your, um, online, uh, what's that? I'm trying to remember what Covey's module is. Online learning, is it? Or is it the prep learning, the, the, the very first one we came in, the very first module that you did the formative for? What's it called? What's that module called? Mm -hmm. Learning methodology, that's correct. Oh, Covey's going to kill me, I forgot it's the name of his module. Learning methodology, some of these concepts are starting to come out, isn't it? About evaluation and critiquing. Now, we will be using a lot of that in this module. Yes, we'll be learning about concepts and frameworks and principles behind the properties of outcome measurement and clinical measurement. But in order to be able to do that, you have to look at the evidence behind them and then be able to uh, criticize. When I use critic the word criticize, it's not in a negative manner. Criticize in academic terminology means that we look at it with, a, with a, a, a much more detail and look at both the pros and the cons the advantages and the disadvantages, what it's capable of and what it's not capable of. That's what critique is. I know that a lot of, um, in different countries, the way student and tutor interactions are very different and the dynamics are very different as well. I mean, from where I come from as well as in a lot of other countries, is these 
student tutor interaction is such that what the, what the tutor says, the student should just follow and not question. But you are at a master's level now. What I want you to do is that there is no one, there is no sacred cow you can't slay. Okay? There's no sacred cow. Okay? If for those of you who don't know what that means, it means that you can criticize anything. No matter it's my work or someone famous that you know who's a physio who's very famous and they publish some work, there you can criticize it. You are in a position, so long as you've got skills and you criticize it appropriately and you have a good academic debate about it, it's fine to criticize it. Okay, there's no sacred cow you can't slay. And then, obviously, because we are focusing very much on outcome measures and clinical measures in this module, so we need and and the final aim is to be able to apply um, our critiquing skills, our evaluation skills, to choosing a type of clinical measurement that is relevant to our own clinical practice. You may have already specialized, or you may not have specialized, it doesn't matter. Because you are learning generic skills, so it can apply across the board. It may, it may, you may change discipline at some point, but those skills still stay relevant. And that's the main good thing about this module. No matter where you go, this, these skills will still be relevant. Okay, so that's what we're trying to do: to choose and effectively use these clinical measurements. But remember, why are we doing choosing all these clinical measurements and outcome measures? The reason for that is because we care for our patients and service users. I mean, for those of you more commercial, as why you call them service users, or not in the clinical setting. For example, physios can be working in a community with third sector charities and services that doesn't you don't usually link to healthcare so we call them service users but obviously it's the main bulk of where our um, uh, um, so clients come from are still patients so we need to be able to enhance their rehabilitation or the service that we provide them and be able to measure whether they've improved stayed the same or got worse and we want them to improve how do we then measure so that we can actually convince them that they've improved? Because a lot of times, patients don't believe you that they've improved, despite the fact that they have, and you know that they have. So being able to measure something like that enables you to convince your patients and your service users that, yes, you have improved. Look, look at the chart. This is what happens every week. You have improved. And if you are a service that requires funding, or someone who has uh, oversight over your service, then you can take those same charts, summarize them and say, look, my patients are improving. What we're doing is effective. And that's the reason why what this module is for. These are all the learning objectives, okay? So, um, let me see, there are four of them, but all four of them all sort of converge into what I've just told you about the aims. So the aim is an overarching aim, but as we look at the learning objectives, we have sort of broken down into separate categories. The first category is the main overarching framework we'll be using, which is ICF, the International Classification of Function. We will be using that a lot and thinking about that a lot because that's what physiotherapists use internationally. Okay? It's a common language that physios use internationally. So when we talk about ICF, we talk about impairments about activity limitations, or you talk about participation restrictions, or if you use terminology, impairment, disability, and handicap, people will still understand you, and then you can, you're able to transcend that national boundaries to be able to talk to each other. Physios should talk to each other, because we are one big family. In order to safeguard our interests, we need to be able to talk to each other. So that's what a first learning objective is, to be able to get you into that mindset of using the ICF. Um, the next learning outcome is mainly concerned with the concepts that is uh, the most relevant to this module in terms of clinical measurements. There are three main ones, obviously there, there can be more than that, but mainly we are talking about validity, reliability and responsiveness. Whenever we talk about an outcome measure or a clinical measurement, these are the three things we think we are concerned about. Whether it is measuring what it says it is measuring, whether if we actually um, do it multiple times or different doing uh, different people using the same uh, things on the same patient or on different patients, do they agree? And is it responsive enough to be able to detect change if there was really a clinical change? And over the weeks, we will look at the 
methodologies and the principles surrounding all of these three main concepts and how to actually interpret and be able to use evidence to look at the ones that you're interested in. Next, all these are grand, all these learning objectives are fantastic. But a lot of times, because physicists are very pragmatic people, after learning about a concept, we always ask ourselves, okay, so now how do I apply this to this one patient which I'm interested in using it on? Okay, you always ask that question, okay, fine, I'm, I'm learning that that's all right, but how does it apply to my patient? And this learning outcome will try to apply some of these theories and looking at different methodologies to be able to apply general concepts and filter down to individual patients. Okay. It's actually more difficult than you think it is. But one thing to always remember that um, we may learn the difficult bits, but at the end of the day, when we do use it, we will have to simplify it at some point. Okay, so but you learn the theory, the principles behind filtering down, but when you actually utilize it, it will be much, much simpler because the patients don't really care about what statistics you use, what framework you use. All they want to know is are they going to get better? when are they going to get better, and how much they're going to get better. And that will point that in that direction. Um, a lot of times, I mean, I don't, know about, I don't know about you, but for me, a lot of times when I see my patient over the years, I've always felt that sometimes I'm not doing any good, or the patient's just not improving the way I want them to do. And when you, when you, when you, when you question yourself like that, you think, is it because of that? terrible physio, really doing nothing for this patient right here, or is it because of other, other reasons? I mean, there are a lot of reasons why a patient will not improve, okay? But one of them could be that um, the, you haven't actually evaluated what are the potential uh, roadblocks that might prevent you from effectively implementing a particular clinical measure. That's one. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's the only one. But surrounding that, there are a lot of potential barriers. And towards the end, we'll talk about what these potential barriers are, what some examples of these potential barriers are. So that when you do go out there back in the clinic, you're able to identify some of these and think about strategies to overcome them. There's no point talking about measuring or um, sort of collecting data and choosing our clinical measure. When we, when we go to the cold phase of clinical practice, we cannot actually apply them and we cannot overcome the barriers that apply them. I'm not going to tell you that I am perfect in the way I apply clinical measurements out of because I don't. I have made lots of mistakes along the way. But the main thing is, yes, you made mistakes, but you should learn from them. That's the main thing you should take away. Any questions so far for me? No? See, do you get what I mean when I do that? I just keep on. Um, now, why are we doing this? I talked about having fun, okay? So I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not, I'm not gonna go into that anymore. Um, all of us know clinical measurements are very important, and I already also explained to you why, how important that. But the next point is, because it's a movement of evidence-based practice, you may be with it or you may not be with evidence-based practice, but the fact is that everyone's using it. So you might as well just jump on the bandwagon because it, jump onto the bandwagon because if you don't, you'll be left behind, and what will happen is that you your practice will be much more diminished. Ultimately, it's not you who will suffer, it's the patients who will suffer if you don't use the evidence behind some of these things. And we will teach you over the entire program to be much more evidence-based. Okay? You think that you have engaged in a lot of literature evidence-based in your undergraduate days? Well, be prepared. You're going to engage more. Okay? Now, another thing in fashion right now, well, not quite in fashion, but over the past five to ten years, is this thing about critical reflective practice. Reflective practice means that you, you don't just do and just carry on with your everyday practice. But what you do is, at the end of the day, or perhaps moments in between your what you're doing, you think back and, and evaluate yourself and think, oh, why have I done that? What's the reasoning behind that? Because when you, you know when you're in a clinic doing things, you don't think. You just carry on because sometimes you just, firstly you're busy, 
you just want to carry on and just simply do the things that has worked the previous time. And then you realize that, oh, actually, should I have done that? Or even if it's right, why have I done that? Is it because it saves me time? Or is it because of, for some reason? Which is why critical reflective practice is very important. It's a bit like, I don't know, I don't, I, I don't know about you, but when I was a child, I used to keep a diary. Like a man don't keep a diary, actually. Men keep a journal. My sister keeps a diary. A psych sister, but there you go. Um, so, what I do is every single day after I finish the day, after, after I come back from school, I take out my journal, my diary, and, like, and then just write and just evaluate what day has happened. That keeps me grounded because as a child, I have. I have lots of emotions going on in my head, and things happen, I may get upset about certain things, but when I come back home, at the end of the day, I can actually step outside, and be slightly more objective, and going, oh, I'm, I was upset about this, 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 uh, John hit me because blah, 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 that's what I said. But then again, I will stand aside and be more objective, but why did I say that to John in the first place? Was it because I didn't like him? Was it because something he did to me? Or was it, something else. And then you can actually think, oh, if that's the case, I may 